the award-winning rapper, poet, founder of the hip-hop Shakespeare company, Akala. You may remember, or you may not remember, a few years ago, I think it was 2014, but don't, don't hold me to that, Gallup, which is an American polling company, did a global survey, 66 countries, over 100,000 people. So this was not just radical, crazy leftists. And they asked people, which country in the world is the greatest danger to world peace? This was before Trump came into office. 25%, 24% to be precise, responded to the United States of America. Yeah? So if people already thought America was the greatest threat to world peace, which by inference means we're part of the threat to world peace. Sorry, 24%. 24%, but that. it was the number one country. How much worse has that got for the people around the world now? This was when Obama was leader. So I think the whole question has to be, and it's disgraceful that we don't have more challenge from anyone in our political establishment, bar a couple of radical, crazy leftist people, whether there's any challenge to the role of America's world as the global policeman. Because most of the world do not accept that. And if we're saying we believe in democracy, why are we not supporting international democracy? Claire Putney, one of the poorest wards in the country, yeah? Traditional working class town. I'm saying, why have you picked what your, why have you, what is the criteria by which you've picked your traditional working class town? I'd like to know. Uh, I when, when was Hackney rich? When was Tottenham rich? When was Moss Side rich? All right, you made the point. About what is the British taxpayer willing to subsidise and what are they not willing to subsidise? For example, in the last 30 years, so across this generation, the British prison population has grown by 82%. It's nothing to do with inequality, it's just because poor people have got innately more criminal. Um, so we're already subsidising a massive underclass. Would a policy like this be effective? Perhaps not. But would a policy that said to people when you get to 18 years of age, there would be, say, interest-free loan available to start a small business, would a policy like that perhaps be effective in reducing wealth inequality? Perhaps. Are we willing to subsidise people's failure or are we willing to subsidise their potential success? That is the question we have to ask. Because we're already subsidising people to a massive extent. We have the biggest prison population in the whole of Western Europe by quite some distance. Um, so it's about what we are willing to pay for and what we're not willing to pay for. But a handout of, of 10 grand but when you're 25? I, I, I've just said to you, I, I don't necessarily think the handout of 10 grand will work because, of course, people on the right will say, poor people get nothing for no reason, and God forbid poor people get anything for no reason. So how about we say money available at, at no interest to start a small business? This is mainstream liberal capitalism. It, it stimulates entrepreneurship in the age of the internet. Why wouldn't people on the right go for such, okay. a, for such a policy? Um, I don't have a particular view on the customs union per se, but, but from my standpoint, Brexit was not really about those technicalities. To me, Bre Brexit was about British nationalism. And I think there's something quite fascinating about a country that was historically an empire, a country that has been one of the largest sources of emigrants in the world. So, for example, we talk a lot about post-war mass migration. In the post-war years, 1.5 million British citizens took state-subsidised migration. 75% of them could not have afforded the journey without the state, to Australia, to Southern Africa, to Canada, to New Zealand. Migration that was not available to those of us who came from the Caribbean. We had to pay our own way, as did the people from India, as did the people from Ghana. So it's fascinating that we've got all this amnesia and all this uh, kind of aggression towards immigrants that we would vote to leave the union. Based on that. Well, the second, okay, according to the, according to the Lord Ashcroft poll data, you're saying you respect democracy. According to Lord Ashcroft poll data... Well, that's not a referendum, is it? That's so, no, just a second. So, according, according to the polling data of the people themselves who voted, immigration was cited as the second most important reason for leaving, even though... That's it was meant, democracy. Just, just a second. Even, even though, as uh, several scholars pointed out, the EU never <clears throat> controlled our immigration laws. So, if, if the people... Them, you can't have it both ways, Chloe, right? If the people themselves voted and you respect that, you've also got respect that they said their second most important reason was immigration. And it so, was very... But hang on, so, so no, but, but hang on Nicole, let's not go into why people voted as they did. What about what's happening now? No, I've just what said, about I, what the, You say you're not interested in no, that. You, you no, I'm you're not, not saying I'm not interested in that. You asked me about the customs union. I said I don't have a particular view on the customs union. So, and do you have a particular view about, about the way it's been discussed in government? Um, I mean, not, are you confident in Theresa May's I'm not confident approach. in anything Theresa May does. Oh. Um, <laughs> I, I, and I'm, I'm, my inclination is that... Brexit, what it will lead to is not independence, but a closer strengthening of the quote-unquote special relationship and an increase of the Anglo-American empire. I notice no one seems to have an issue with the fact that we have American military bases on our soil that we didn't get a vote about. Why is that not an issue? Uh, please, please don't believe me. It was a documentary on BBC, but we ain't studying history. Too busy watching MTV. Why are you crying? You're the boobs,